God puts us in nations, in places, not by mistake, but to do a job. What if we opened our eyes to the needs of our colleagues, of our leaders, of our subordinates, and we were a priest on their behalf? My name is Brett Johnson. I'm Lynn Johnson. And we'd like to welcome you to the Repurposing Business podcast that will be coming to you each week. We'll be sharing stories of people in the marketplace, amazing things that God has done, principles about how to do business with God, how to co-labor with Him, and just encouraging tools, tips, resources that we'll share with you. Please join us this week and every week. And today we're going to speak about global giants. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, um, back in well, 2006, it was 4th of July, I was about to meet with a guy whose goal was to give away a billion dollars. He didn't have it all yet. He had a fair chunk of money, but he wanted to give away a billion dollars that could be used primarily for evangelism, expansion of the kingdom. And I went for a walk before I met with him, spent some time praying, and we'd observed some things during that time. What we'd observed was that God was giving kingdom business people ideas for businesses. These were businesses or products or new ways of doing things that were actually divinely inspired. That's what they were. And, um, and we call these inspired innovations. And it sounds fantastic, but it's not automatic that an inspired innovation makes its way to marketplace and becomes a flourishing business. Why? Because one of the things that it needs is capital. On the other hand, uh, living in Silicon Valley at the time, uh, we met a number of people who felt uh, they were gifted with capital. They understood capital as a resource and they wanted to deploy it well. And so on the one hand, we had people with ideas and on the other hand, people with capital, but they didn't always meet. Why? Because the idea, the co issue was complicated by the fact that when God gives a Christian an idea, they become very protective of the idea. And it doesn't matter whether they're a business person or running an NGO or running a church. Uh, if they got it from God, they want to steward it. And when a person with capital comes along, there's always the danger that when they bring capital, they take control or they at least bring influence. And so you get this tension. So, and when God was giving these ideas to people, the people with money felt these are wacky Christians sometimes. You know, they, they, they know God and they've got a great product or business idea, but they don't have a lot of organizational capital or a high organizational quotient. And they certainly don't understand how the world of finance and money works. And so people say that money makes people funny, uh, capital makes people crazy, or at least certainly flushes out issues. And so uh, I saw the need for an organization that would sit in the middle between the inventors and the investors, if you like, and ensure that each got a fair return, but where greed was mitigated because they agreed to put an excess into funding future kingdom initiatives and the expansion of the kingdom. That was the basic need that I identified. So global giants, we have to ask the question, what is a giant? And so we know that a giant is a societal ill, something that is not functioning the way God designed it to function, or something that has perverted the way that God designed something to function. And those could be industry or geography specific. And I think everybody's familiar with those. And um, uh, if you look at things like the sustainable development goals used to be called the millennium development goals, you'll see that uh, even in the world, there's an understanding that some things are not right and they need to be set right. And many of those things are what we call global giants. By the way, let me just say that in my work with leaders, I've discovered that advanced leaders or leaders in an advanced stage of life are actually uh, prone to tackling giants. That's what they do. So once Richard Branson has figured out how to do an airline or a record label or a soft drink or whatever, then he's on to how do I solve a big problem? Same thing is true for Bill Gates. It's like, okay, so I've got the biggest company in the world or I'm the richest guy in the world. Now what am I going to do? 
malaria or access to clean water or Mark Zuckerberg, what's here, but how do we give everybody access to internet? So at the advanced stages of leadership, we tackle giants. Why? Because we're made to fight giants. That's part of being made in the image of God. Whether you think that giant is you know, tackling life on Mars or whether it's solving you know, access to education for people or access to electricity for people uh, in some part of the world. So now, for those who don't know us, and some of you have less exposure, uh, we have started the Institute in 1996. God spoke pretty clearly. And so we formed a company. Uh, we'd already started a nonprofit, and uh, we have a community. It's an informal community called the Repurposing Business Community. And uh, of late, although it's been on the cards for a long time, we have uh, the I-4 centers, and, and Cliff and some others have worked in the I-4 center. It's basically a combination incubator, accelerator, uh, collabor that would get behind collaboratives to tackle giants. And then more recently, in recent years, uh, we've set up the Global Giants Foundation and Global Giants Investment Holding Company. Why? Because often capital is a missing element to societal transformation. So we started off saying our tagline is repurposing business, transforming society. And it takes capital in many forms, as we've discussed during the Kingdom Economics class, to transform a society. But financial capital is one piece. It just needs to be done in a way that is different from the way that the world handles financial capital. And that's what this is about. So there's this gap between inventor and investor, which I've talked about. And the idea of global giants is to bridge that gap. Now, in case you think this is theoretical, right now, I'm involved with a bunch of Christians who are looking at building a new city. It would create 270,000 jobs, a lot of jobs, it would be a multi-billion dollar project that would span decades. It would be hugely transformational. And there's a group of guys who've worked on this concept, worked with architects, environmental planners, town planners, uh, landowners, tribal leaders, government leaders, and others for many years. And they hold that idea close to their chest. And they're going to need capital. So along comes somebody who will provide capital, and um, they have a different set of metrics. They have a different set of filters. And unless we get those people on the same page and speaking the same language, and it's not just when the deal is signed, because this will be a multi-billion dollar deal, it's going to be a requirement that they sit down on a quarterly basis and on an annual basis and iron out stuff. And unless there's a party in the middle that's going to hold them um, in unity uh, through the spirit, then it's not going to happen. It's going to be way too risky. And this is just a, a practical thing that's happening right now. So it's not a, a theoretical concept. So just unpacking the purpose of Global Giants, comprehensively capitalizing, capital in all its forms, inspired innovations. I've talked a little about what those are. To tackle global issues, these are the things that are on God's heart that God cares about. And the so that is so that society can be transformed, so that we can complete our mandate and the kingdom of God is advanced. When you have funds, those funds are often focused on a technology or on a geography, they might be focused on a particular industry. That's the organizing principle. So we are going to uh, raise a fintech fund for Africa, or we're going to uh, raise a fund to deal with genomics, or we're going to raise a fund to deal with a geography like Southeast Asia, for example. The organizing principle here is the tackling of giants. So what would our process look like? It looks pretty standard. Find stuff, evaluate it, finance it, accelerate it and incubate it if need be, and then put it into a context of kingdom community. But let's go back to that first step. What does it mean to find in context? Well, the find in context in our case is a little bit different because actually what it's looking at is starting with transforming society. So as you know, we've been going into different nations 
figuring out what goes on in that city or in that nation to say, what are the assets? What are the sectors of society? What are the foundations of the society? What are the giants? And who's tackling those giants? Who's addressing the needs in the society? Then we ask ourselves, what are the gaps? So are there any aspects that are missing? Now, if you roll back uh, the last 20, 30, 50 years of Christians in missions, uh, often you'll find that they flock to one area and ignore many other areas. So if an earthquake happens in Haiti or in Peru, then people tend to go to the town that CNN goes to, but not necessarily the whole country or the whole community. And so we would identify where the gaps are and then figure out how capital can be a part of solving that problem. So as you know, we have a cadre of people who've been trained, some in transforming society, many more in repurposing business. And there are certain nations and areas that we have a focus on. I'm not going to play you through this. I'll send you the, the deck afterward. But here I have one of our groups that's just coming out of transforming society that is tackling uh, the giants in a particular industry, which is the food industry. And so Brunt is on the call. Okay. He's part of this group. And you can go and watch the brilliant presentation by Brunt and his team on uh, how to tackle the giants in a particular industry. Let me pause and just check if there's any questions so far. We will have a chance for questions, of course, at the end as well. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Right, so what is Global Giants? There's two aspects. One is legal and one is function. So legally, it's a foundation which has been endowed with certain assets. So what we've done is taken the repurposing business training and the Transforming Society training out of the Institute, and we've endowed it into the foundation. A foundation needs an endowment. Typically, if you're in a university and you've got a Harvard or you've got a Yale or a Stanford, they have a huge endowment. That's normally cash. In our case, we've put in intellectual capital into the foundation. And then there's a second piece, which is an investment holding company. So the foundation will not make investments. It will steward intellectual capital and some other things and provide a purpose and a context governance. Uh, the investments will be done through the investment holding company. Both are based in Mauritius. And um, some of you understand Mauritius really well. Uh, Dirk does work there, among others. And um, functionally, what we're doing is looking to link together movements that are involved in transforming society, scale up repurposed businesses so that they can have an increased impact. What we found over the years as we've worked with over 400 companies is that there's a percentage of them which could easily be replicated. They don't always think of it that way, but they're a good business. They're a solid business. It's not a startup. Oh, I've got an idea to do, you know, an app. No, this is an existing business that could go to many nations with the right capital and the right support. And so it's scaling up existing stuff. And then looking at the area of governance, we've talked about ESG and how it could potentially get hijacked and so forth. But the fact is, uh, governance beyond ESG that provides governance from a biblical perspective as well. And that involves the fivefold ministries, a mix of people who cover all the slices of lemon leadership and bring to bear a biblical view of governance to the investments. And then we've worked uh, for many years on a set of metrics for impact that go beyond just the typical people, planet and profit and uh, that would be brought into the equation as well. So we're raising funds for two entities. One is for the foundation and one is for the investment holding company. On the foundation side, this is actually in the category of grants, gifts, and we will crowdfund this with the REAP community and with others initially. And um, so what that would do is really cover the costs of the foundation and the foundation would be focused on making sure that the purpose remains 
true. On the investment side, uh, the target is initially a fund of about 10 million growing to about $100 million. Unless you get to $100 million, it's hard to have a sustainable fund. And the that initially would be open to qualified investors, which some of you are not keen to hear, but uh, the foundation side would be open uh, to anybody. And I'll unpack these a little bit more. So part of what we would do is to uh, support both of these entities. So right away, the foundation itself, which we set up in 2018, is an evergreen foundation. So the beneficiary of the foundation is the foundation itself, and then also uh, of the Global Giants Investments Company, the beneficiary is the foundation. So the idea is that there would be an evergreen foundation. It's not, uh, it's different from a fund that has a five-year horizon and then it cashes out. So yes, at, at the individual investment level, which happens in the investment holding company, you could say we're going to have a fund that's going to focus on Zimbabwe or it's going to focus on green tech or it's going to focus on fintech uh, and tackling the giants in that area or could, could focus on a geography. And that would have uh, an exit strategy associated with that. The, uh, the investment holding company would keep an interest so that capital can be used as a vehicle for discipleship. Um, and uh, the terms and conditions around that would be uh, some of them generic and some on a deal by deal basis. So just so that you know, the purposes of the foundation as filed in the charter, and we did have a little bit of difficulty with language around kingdom and so forth, because uh, Mauritius is a somewhat Hindu nation. It's a mixed nation, but um, they do have some Hindu influence and so on. And uh, uh, when you use the word kingdom, it's whose kingdom and so forth. So, uh, but these are the, of the, this is the purpose as stated over here, and you can read that for yourself. And so in terms of the the add-on to that, the intention of the Global Giants is to provide continuous stewardship of capital in all of its forms in an evergreen foundation that provides a return and uh, accomplishes societal transformation with goals that are similar to the SDGs, but from a biblical perspective and continuing in perpetuity. So that's, that's the concept, the language. So how would this operate? So practically, uh, there's a lot of people that have an interest in Africa, as an example, uh, as well as other parts of the world. And part of what we would like to do is bring local investors and non-local investors together. We would source opportunities, filtering them, and I'll explain how we'll do that a little bit. And then Encourage the investment in collaboratives. We don't really believe that one company tackles a giant really well, no, unless you're a, a major, major international player. Typically, it takes a collaborative to take down a giant. And uh, the final part is that we would have pre-agreed returns. If you don't pre-agree returns, it's very hard to mitigate greed. Now, when there's no money on the table, everybody agrees. We're doing this for the glory of God. We're doing this for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Our own experience has shown that when money becomes apparent, then people say, well, I deserve more because I provided the funding or I came up with the idea, I came up with the product and so forth. And so people need to agree upfront in writing what's going to be fair returns, and that some portion is going to go into the ongoing funding of kingdom initiatives. Just a little bit on the sourcing side, I'll unpack that for you in a moment, but um, uh, let's just talk about the investors first. So uh, in some respects, you might say there's four categories of investors, and I just break it down into the planners and these people who want predictable returns. I want to put my money into a money market account, and I'll put it into a wealth front account or to an indexed fund where I get six or seven or eight percent a year, and um, they are not our target audience. Then you get people who are more the, the uh, pioneers, 
folks who are geared towards taking a greater risk and they say, yeah, I would rather be in something that's more direct, that's more risky. Uh, I could get a bigger return, but I'm willing to risk more. And then there are those that say, look, I think that the current systems and current businesses could be improved and taken to the next level. And these are people who are saying, yeah, banking systems are banking systems and we can modify them. Uh, pharma systems or media systems can be changed and improved from the inside out. And then those who are saying, look, we want to, we want to actually reform the platforms and change the system. So I've, I've broken people up into those different categories. And our focus is really uh, towards the last three. Now, I say half of the pilgrims because our goal, I don't think, is to go and to find startups that are just from the ground up. It's a very tricky business. Uh, venture capitalists do that. Angel investors do that. Just looking for winners and uh, generally about seven out of 10 that they invest in fail. And they only invest in one in 500 or one in 1,000. So the stats aren't great. For us, though, the ones that would fall into that category would be ones where there's a gap in transforming society. And if somebody did this, then it could address a need in society, not an isolated uh, startup. So in terms of the investment structures, those would be ring-fenced and there are mechanisms within the Mauritian law uh, where you can have special purpose vehicles or protected cell organizations so that if some people are interested in doing something in Zimbabwe and some people are interested in doing something in healthcare or in hospitality, if Zimbabwe goes down the tubes, it doesn't impact the others. So those would be, um, those would be ring fenced if you like. And so uh, there would be some equity stake. I've seen some Christians who get involved in investing and they say, well, if God gave Melissa an idea, it's her idea and we don't want to own any share of the company. And what they tend to do is they give up their ability to have a positive influence through capital. And so I think it's quite fair to have an equity stake and uh, as a means of both funds generation and ongoing uh, keeping the relationships intact. I have a friend who's a venture capitalist. Uh, they invested a chunk of money in a company in England. And when, once they've invested about 80% of the money, the CEO, a Christian said, I don't want to take your calls. I don't like your questions. Uh, why are you asking me these questions, etc.?" And they had no mechanism in place to ensure that there was ongoing relationship, accountability, transparency. Etc. So this is what we're shooting for. We're shooting for about 10 million initially. This is on the investment side of things and growing that. And so it would be equivalent, if you like, to what you might call a search fund. So the fund would be created and we would say, okay, we will then find the right things to invest in. And uh, those things would be in, uh, presented to the investor pool and they would decide together on the investment structures and how that would be managed and so forth. And so uh, we would provide ongoing equipping, mentoring, measurement of impact uh, through many of the tools that you've come to know through the Institute and we would agree on fair returns. From the investee perspective, we are interested in people that we know who have the right heart, the right hands, the right heads, people initially who've been through the repurposing business process or that is baked into the deal. So if there's an organization we think it's a great investment, they haven't been through a repurposing business process, that's fine. We'll build that into the first year or so of the deal. We're looking for scalable businesses, uh, focusing on a limited number of giants initially and um, focusing on bringing collaboratives together. What do I mean by that? So Cliff and I were involved in something, uh, say, in the energy industry, in the energy industry, renewable energy uh, in Africa. One person thinks that batteries and battery storage is the answer. Somebody else thinks solar is the answer. Somebody else thinks no wind is the answer. Somebody else thinks, no, it's waves, it's not wind, and on and on and on. The reality is none of them on their own are an answer. 
But when you package them together, you can create the equivalent of an alternative to utility, you can solve a problem. And so when we talk about collaboratives, it's looking at a system-wide perspective, not just three fools in a flip chart who want to get together. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about complementary businesses in a business impact network that can actually come together to solve a problem. Now, if you don't link it to transforming society, if you don't have a big enough purpose, things will go sideways. The ultimate aligning principle, as we know, is what is it that glorifies God, that pleases him? And that has to be kept there when one's looking at the question of capital. Otherwise, as I said, capital can make people uh, crazy or at least controlling. So what would some of the benefits be? I think we expect to see returns that you could put into these three categories. Steady returns. These are existing businesses. It's a business in Cape Town, a business in Johannesburg, a business in Lagos or in San Francisco or anywhere else that could be replicated and redeployed. Uh, so if you take, for example, a Brunt's business, it works. It works in South Africa. It's worked in South Africa for 20 plus years. Where else could that work in the world? Well, it could work anywhere where the raw material ingredient is prevalent, which would be Mexico, the United States, and other spots in the world. It's not rocket science. You know what the factory looks like. You know what the numbers look like. Now, with the right capital, that could be replicated. Why would you replicate it out? Because you want to expand the kingdom of God. You want to take the influence that's been created in that business and replicate it out. And so, um, you know, there would be uh, value in doing that, and it would create a steady return. Is it the return of creating the next Google or the next Facebook? No, it's not. But uh, it would still be a steady return, and it solves a real problem that God cares about. It tackles a giant at two levels, one on the health side, and the other would be at the industry level, in the food security side or in the, uh, that whole industry, the issues that, uh, that are covered in the earlier presentation. So that's an example of a steady return. Let me talk about the structural one next because uh, the structural one, and by the way, on that one, we would look at the businesses that have been through the reprocess and those that are in the community and say, okay, which of those businesses could be taken out, replicated further? On the structural side, it's hard to change the society when you don't provide the infrastructure for business being doing being done well. So, you know, uh, there's been studies done that companies that have access to information and communication technologies do better than countries that don't. It sounds simple, but it, it's pretty clear. But providing capital for uh, for cities for technology, for dams, for infrastructure, for ports, for railroads, for airports, for water, et cetera. Uh, these are pretty big projects, but they're infrastructure investments. And so the goal would be to be involved in raising funds for such investments. There would be some initial fees. And then typically there's a, a variety of sub-entities that are part of that uh, that get associated with it. So, for example, if you're going to uh, do a large project, there's many subcontractor issues, but there's uh, and opportunities, many sub businesses that would be spun off from that. So, that's the second one. And then the third one would come out of transforming society initiatives, where we go in and we're working in a geography. Let's just say we go down and we do a transforming society venture in Hrobo, just outside Cape Town, and say, okay. There are some things that are gaps there and they need to be incubated, accelerated, and those would be a higher risk, higher return, and have a higher equity stake. So one and two would be the uh, firstly existing businesses that can be scaled, then the, uh, the structural ones, and then finally the spearheading ones. And I think it needs a mix of all of those uh, to provide a good return. Okay, so what are the benefits to the investors? 
Uh, I've been involved in several initiatives where there's an increasing uh, interest in Africa, for example, as well as other parts of the world. And often what the overseas investors are looking for is a local partner. It gives them great comfort if an investor is coming in from the UK and Andre finds an investment from the UK and Dirk has found an investor in South Africa who's already committed to that, then Andre can be assured that Dirk has done some level of due diligence and the two uh, forms of capital complement each other. Historically, capital out of the West, it's either been paternalistic or worst case, it could be, um, you know, it could be said to be uh, predatory in a way. We're taking the raw materials out of a country and we're not doing local beneficiation. So that's a problem. Uh, or it could be done in a collaborative way. And if we believe that God has placed capital in every nation to bless those nations, then there's something in the nations and there's something among the people in the nations that can be complemented with people from other parts of the world. The kingdom of God is multinational. The kingdom of God is cross-cultural. It is all of these things by definition. And so when you've got a local partner partnering with somebody who's coming from another part of the world, wherever that might be, another part of the continent, another part of the world, then there's value added to that. And over the years, over the decades, we've built up those relationships so we can help people partner with the right people. I met a guy in Johannesburg, an American, uh, his father made a shed load of money. He came to Johannesburg to do good with capital, you know, do well, uh, do good while doing well type of deal. He told me he'd burned $300 million in Africa and had nothing to show for it. And part of it is not having local partners who understand the issues and that's true on a country by country basis. So we think that there'd be decreased risk, there'd be a, a better measurement, and there'd be support from a community of kingdom minded people. This is a capital that is a, both a spiritual capital, a relational capital, a human capital, if you like. So we think these are some of the benefits. So just touching on a couple of uh, a different additional piece of information, but let me just pause for questions first, and then I've anticipated some of your questions later on. Let's see if I've if I've done a good job with that. But let me just check if there's any questions or comments so far. Um, otherwise, I'll ask you a question. But you mentioned that um, there's a board of governors. Did you say board of governors? Yeah, quite correct. Yeah. Um, are you going to talk more about who they are? Yeah, so the um, let me see if I've got that in the questions over here, or, or if I've got it in, in one of the... Uh, yeah, so the initially to set it up, Janet, what we needed was um, you have to have a local person involved, and so we have a local firm that's a, a hired firm who, who does that, and, um, and then uh, the founder, if you like, of the foundation was not me. Um, it, I set it up deliberately so that it was not set up uh, by somebody who's a U.S. tax resident uh, so that uh, it's not, Mauritius is not a tax haven, but I uh, just didn't want it tied back to somebody who was uh, going to become a part of that. So it was set up by a gentleman out of South Africa. His name is Norman Noland, and uh, he's a chartered accountant, like a CPO. He set up a group called Nolands, which is still going, which is a tax audit consultancy. He also has a company called Dell Capital, and uh, that is an investment company. He's done business in Mauritius for 20, 30 years, has good relationships with government, etc. So he was uh, the... the uh, settler of the foundation, if you like. And uh, the expectation is to have about seven. So initially, it's just three to get set up, and then we would add others into that. And so I have a list of people. And then on the investment holding company side, many of the day-to-day -day functions would actually be outsourced. So fund management and uh, 
and a number of other activities over there. Uh, bookkeeping and, and those types of issues are all done by a local firm. But the uh, the plan will be to set it up that the, and I we have the full charter, which I'm happy to, to let you have, and the bylaws, as well as I've got a concept document that's about 20, 30 pages that explains in details how all of this works. But the initial three people is a local guy, Norman Noland and myself, and I'm the protector of the foundation. So basically, you know, I have the responsibility similar to a, a protector in a trust for day-to-day -day operations. Um, for the foundation, do you accept non-Christian money, the values alone? Yeah, so the um, so long as they they're bought into the principle, the 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 purposes of the foundation, they understand what that is. That's that's um, yeah, and it's it's not that on the on the foundation level, it's not that the uh, you know if if somebody gives you know ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't come with um, decision making abilities and so forth. So if they understand the purposes and they want to do that, that's fine. Yeah. Brad, it strikes me that the uh, people of Islamic faith have a lot of similar kind of activity. Is, do you see overlap in the future? Or Yeah, Nelson, thank you. When I was writing the book Repurposing Capital, I did quite a lot of uh, research into Islamic finance. And they do have a bunch of good tenants in, in what they do. And they are better, I think, at utilizing capital purposefully often than Christians are. Mm -hmm. um, so many years ago, I asked, well, 40 years ago, a friend of mine said to me, the biggest issue in Africa is leadership because the lack of good, solid, principled leadership is causing problems in Africa. Yeah. So when I asked some other friends of mine in about 2005, what do you think the biggest problem is in Africa? They said immediately, the Muslims are buying up the place. <laughs> now, uh, now you can blame the Chinese if you like, because they're in on the act. But we can, we can blame the Muslims, or we can blame the Chinese, or we can say, why are the Christians missing in action? You know, right. we struggle to give $10,000 to somebody who's doing good work in Lesotho, uh, but we don't have the multi-billion dollar fund that's needed to bring about transformation in Africa. And so this is one of the drivers behind the need for this fund. It's not good enough just to say what I call straining at nets and gulping down cap ca camels. What I found, like in Silicon Valley back in 2000, and I wrote a paper called Kingdom Capitalists. People told me, Brett, the issue is that Christians don't have big ideas. If they had big ideas, we would fund them. All they want is 5,000 there for a food bank or 10,000 maybe to fix the, the roof on their building. But nobody has a big idea. If there was a big idea, we would open up our wallets and the money would come. And I remember testing the first guy where I asked him for a million bucks, not for us, for another project. The guy nearly choked on his salad. Um, and, um, and so we have to get honest about this and say it takes big chunks of capital. But I'm excited that there's a new wave of younger, newer money, if you like, earn my own money, didn't get it from my grandfather, people who are believers who are saying, okay, it's going to take serious money. If we want to change Madagascar or Mozambique or Zimbabwe, it's going to take serious money with the right governance and with the right framework for deploying it. And uh, the Muslims understand that, you know, I will invest in your business. And then three years from now, you got to go to Mecca and then you got to do this. Then you got to pay it forward. They build discipleship into their capital. Uh -huh. And Christians are dichotomized. They say the left hand shouldn't know what the right hand's doing. So if I put a thousand, you know, ten thousand dollars into Silicon's newest business idea or a hundred thousand dollars into that or whatever, I'll get my return in heaven. That's it. The money's gone. And there's no iron sharpens iron ongoing. How do we keep doing this better? Now, we will fail at some of the investments that we make with global giants. Some people will be more Christian than Jesus, but they'll turn out to be fakes. 
We will try to get them through the reap laundromat, as a friend of mine calls it. We will try to do some of that stuff, but it's not a guarantee. But, you know, if we're investing in 10 things that attract tackling energy in Africa and one of them goes belly up, it's fine. There's nine more. Our goal is not to make every one of the 10 successful. It's to take down the giant of lack of access to energy, for example. And so we will have different metrics and, um, and have different expectations. We would have high expectations. Yeah. I am. Um... And- I'm sorry, one follow-up question. Do you sort of publish your metrics in advance of the initiative? Yeah, so that would be, uh, and that's where the Transforming Society initiative comes in because what happens when we went, and, and Susan was on the team that went into Madagascar, for example, in 2018, we go in there and we say, what are the sectors of society? What are their existing assets, which often people don't see locally, for example? No. What are the giants? And then what are the, who, which are the key corporations and organizations which need to be repurposed? And then a big question is, what would it look like if the glory of God was restored to this place, both to industries, to cities, and to the nations? So we want to see what the future would look like. And so... Um, I was just listening in my devotionals this morning to the story about Jackie Pullinger, who went to Hong Kong, and she lived in the walled city, as you know the story. And she's lived in filth, in squalor, in poverty, dealing with drug addicts and all sorts of other things. She said, I've lived in that setup, but I've also always seen a future city that is crime-free, drug-free, etc cetera, etc cetera. and we hold these two things in tension and, mm. and the latter is the metrics that we want to have in mind that's what we should involve and it's better than people planet and profit it's better than a bit of sustainability it's better than do good capital and it's better than controlling people with an agenda that's either a capitalist or an environmentalist or a uh gender equality or whatever agenda it's the restoration of the glory of god in nations you know so that people from every tongue tribe and nation uh, can come to know him see him glorify him yeah and so that that would be agreed this is what we're shooting for otherwise you would have a misunderstanding if if clifford nelson melissa and dirk on my second row on my screen um agreed we're going to tackle you know namibia and we're shooting for something. If you don't agree what your outcomes are up front, you know, every agenda, every hope, every desire has to be there and hashed out up front. And this is part of also discipling investors uh, along with investees. And there's not much in place to disciple investors. You know, okay, Andre's got 10 million to invest. Therefore, he must be a smart guy. Therefore, he must understand kingdom capital. Therefore, he must have his desires and his wishes and his metrics aligned with the kingdom of God. No, Andre's got $10 million and he's a Christian and he's going to heaven. But it doesn't mean that the person providing the money doesn't need to be discipled just Mm -hmm. as much as the investee needs to be discipled. It's a two-way street and it's enriching to both. Thanks. That's exciting. Mm. I really couldn't agree more with that. And I'm so grateful to hear that because as I've talked with different potential donors and investors over the years, you're looking for someone who you can really talk to and who has a heart to heart understanding of what you're going for. And a lot of people have good intentions in the beginning, but then they don't know how to follow through. They don't know how to keep supporting you. They don't know what to do when trouble comes. They don't know what to do and somebody needs to teach them so that you can be successful together. Yeah. So Global Giants is more than a fund. It's the in-between organization with the metrics, with the discipleship mechanisms, with the mechanisms around how does this build towards the objectives of, of advancing the kingdom. And But everybody agrees up front that we will play an ongoing role on an ongoing basis. I mean, if a company is sold and it's an end or we all get kicked out of um, you know, Tunisia or whatever, 
that's understood. But generally, it's an ongoing role so that uh, the investees don't just run off with the money once they've got it, or uh, you know, the investors don't force an exit strategy when this is somebody's lifelong calling, which is the other issue. Capital often separates people from their calling. And so the, the governance components of this is keeping the thing focused on the broad societal transformation on the kingdom agenda. Scott, you were going to say something? Um, uh, well, I was going to ask, but you answered my question a bit in another um, in, in your in one of your answers previously. But I, I, I what's fascinating me is that the tension um, created between the the mission and the investor, um, and you, you touched on a couple of things, but I think I think they're worth repeating, and the beneficiation end of this. Um, is something that I know in, in my world, um, which it, it might be entertainment, but it's always still business and it's still technology. So it, 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 it lines up perfectly with what we're talking about. But there's often, um, you know, the investor is treated like an ATM machine. Hey, thanks. We got it from here. And then the investee, like you just said, um, loses, loses their vision when they've received the capital. Um, and often, and they'll often just start running without even without the team that God has provided around them, because the capital gives them a, a sense of independence, a sense of um, maybe they don't need to stop and discern as much as they did when they didn't have the capital. So I, I just, I, I just think it's worth repeating that those, that discipleship, that two way discipleship is, I think at the very center of the, the potential success and or failure of this. Um, if those things, if that is there, just wow. I mean, I, I, the, the discipleship of what people could learn on both sides of that and the beneficiation of discipleship. Um, wow. Just, just awesome. Mm. I would love to hear about that for just an hour. <laughs> yeah. You know, in kingdom economics, we talked about the fact that capital is broadly defined and we shouldn't underplay the importance of financial capital nor of intellectual capital or artistic capital, if you like, or cultural capital. And so, so it's placing a value on all of these things and not letting one capital try to trump the other because then we get into playing funny games. You know, when spiritual capital trumps financial capital, it's a problem. That's what happens in the world of religion. Or if creative capital trumps financial capital in your world, uh, Scott, for example, or somebody else, you know, there's everybody wants to be God and be at the center, but God is God. And all of these other things have to be submitted to his, his agenda. And so the role of global giants is not to play God, but is to make sure that all the parties stay honestly at the table and don't get the financial capital and run off or get control of an entity and then run off uh, as happens, you know, when games are played. Yeah. I think, I think most people would, would not go as far to say I'm playing God in this scenario. I am God now in this, but I think they would say they want to be Moses or they want to be David or they want to be Abraham. And the fact is most of us are Aaron or Joshua or Timothy and um, and I, I I like what you said there because I think that does that does apply. But I think even great, very self conscious Christians would 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 admit that they want to be the Moses of their generation or the David of that of that situation. Um, and in fact, uh, God has uh, most of us in the uh, in the lower tier, I would say, and we should be surrendered to that. I think mostly. I think it's a hard question to ask God, uh, how do you find success, define success around something? What is our role in this thing? And as Jesus said, look, when you've done everything that you're supposed to do, you just say we're unprofitable servants. We've just done what we're supposed to do. So if we can keep everybody honest, whereas in the, in the <clears throat> venture capital world, we blow up the founder 
like they're they're fantastic and they begin to believe all of their own advertising and so on. It's like, no, I mean, you've provided capital. That's great. God's given you an idea because you've figured out how to hear God. It's great. So Brunt has a new idea for a replacement for coffee or whatever. That's great. But Brunt, that doesn't make Brunt the coffee king. You know, that makes him a child of God who heard God and who was obedient. And then other people come in around him. And it it's, keeps some level of honesty with us. Okay, so, um, so there were a couple of questions that I thought you might ask. So I'll just put them up here. <clears throat> so first one, <laughs> when will Global Giants Foundation start? So it's operational and it's ready. And orig originally, what's got me stuck for many, many years, part of what I've thought about, apart from setting up the structures and getting it reviewed, and now International Lynn said to me, Brett, are you sure that this thing is 100% fine? And we've had it reviewed uh, by international tax people and so forth. Of course, tomorrow, all the governments can change their laws and stuff would, would have to change, but, but it is what it is for right now. And so, and I had thought, well... You know, we have to have a fancy structure so that if somebody puts in a million dollars, that's well accounted for. But if one uh, crowdfunds that, if you like, opens it to retail uh, people at the foundation level, because these are gifts, grants, endowments, then we don't have that limitation. So that's open. Then we'll, when will investment start? Um, I'm saying 2022 because there are some things that we're working on right now simultaneously. The roles of key players, who's going to manage the fund and so on, uh, arrangements with local funding partners, so organizations that say, yeah, I buy into this, I want to be part of this. And then just uh, we, we have a bit of a pipeline, but just making sure that we articulate that. And so that's something that would happen in 2022. Um, but if people are interested, we will uh, we would certainly begin those conversations now. So the question was asked, and we touched on this earlier, how will the pipeline come about? Because a lot of people say, oh, there's tons of capital. The key issue is what they call deal flow. Where is that going to come from? So I would say past REAP clients that can scale. I think there's a, sub, a small percentage of them, but a good good number of them. And then deal flow from partners. So there are people on this call and elsewhere who are already working with companies. Some are past read clients, some are inventors, some are existing businesses that could scale and so forth. And they already are working and um, could go to another level if we work together. And then those that would be identified through Transforming Society Ventures. So we are busy planning out what those ventures would look like for 2022 and coming out of that. So practically, let's just say we go into an area like George or Krabo or Harare or Malawi or Madagascar, and we do a Transforming Society Venture. Part of what we would do is at the tail end of that, open that up for potential investors to say, okay, we've scoped out the entities that require investment to put the societal transformation plan into place. This is where we think they would be ready. These are existing organizations. They're doing a great job already right there and they can be grown. And here's a gap where we need to actually get behind a startup and take them through an incubation pro process to grow them into that. So those would be, that would be the, where the flow would come from. Okay, is there a return of funds given into the foundation? No, uh, that's an endowment as such. And that's just like, okay, just like you gave money to the Stanford endowment or the Yale or the Harvard or whatever it might be, your favorite uh, business school or, so there's, there's no particular thing except I guess we can put your name on a, on a T-shirt and Wildcats will put it up for you with a, a nice logo. You know, we'll do something for you special. But what return can I expect? Is this like, oh, I'm investing in Christian stuff, so I shouldn't be expect any return on the investment side? So it kind of depends on, on several things. Obviously, the nature of the business. And then also whether you're investing in a pool of businesses or a specific business. So when I say a specific business, some businesses might be big enough 
that you say, look, I want to directly invest in this business. It's a $10 million business or a $100 million business. And others might be, look, I'm interested in the collaborative that's tackling, in our example, that energy problem. Uh, project or problem in Africa. And so each of those would be looked at and you would understand what your returns are. In principle, we are looking, expecting market returns and a sustainable impact. So when you look at impact investing and so forth, they are getting as good as, if not better than market returns. So it's not like, oh, we're doing this for Jesus, so we shouldn't expect any return. Uh, we would be unsustainable on that basis. Obviously, we're trying to mitigate risk by having this as part of the overall process that we're doing and um, putting things into a pool, if you like, so there's some level of uh, divergence or uh, spreading the risk. But we're not looking at, well, you did this in Africa for Jesus and you lost your money too bad. We're actually looking for market returns. And if there is something that we do that has to be done to transform a society and it's not financially viable on its own, if there's an exceptional case on that, then that could be tackled in a different way. In other words, working with donors and others who are happy to do that. You know. So... Will all investees have to go through the REIT process? Yes. Uh, but let's just say that Salem has a business idea. It's a great business idea. It's part of a societal transformation initiative. He hasn't been through the process. Uh, he would agree to go through it during the first year of funding. So that would be part of that. And in fact, typically uh, in the accelerator incubator process, that's built in there. So if you think about your 10 Ps that you cover in a venture, think about those spread over one P a month with all of the support around it and so on. Um, so we want people exposed to all of the biblical principles, both to keep people on purpose and then to mitigate risk. So people might say, okay, if I put money into the investment pool, can I propose a business for funding? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, we want to encourage that. You know, we, we really want to encourage that because uh, we want people to be to be actually having access to funds that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise and within the broad parameters. You know, this is, is got to be tackling a giant. It's not just some random thing and typically tied into societal transformation initiative. That would be you know, the requirements. Okay, what questions did I miss? I only have seven short questions. So, Brett, you talked about the potential pipeline. Is there a list of companies already or companies that um, you've talked to? Yes, I do have a list. And, um, and that list will grow with our partners because we have quite a few organizations who are interested in working with us and they have existing lists as well. Mm. And um, so, so it's a, it's, we do have an existing list. And um, yeah, so um, now we would take that conversation with them to the next level once we've got a fund in place, but it's, 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 it's a push and a pull. You need to both build the list and, and raise the fund at the same time because people want to know exactly what you're saying. Okay, so what type of businesses are you talking about? Are you talking mom and pop? Are you talking mid-market? How does mm -hmm. this work? Are they ge geographic? With your background, you'll know the countries that we've worked in. So we have quite a lot of stuff coming out of South Africa, which you might expect uh, in different industries. And we have people who are actually brilliant inventors. They classically fit, fit this situation where they have created world-class products, but they've either been blocked by the government locally for suspect reasons, or they haven't had the access, access to capital that would take them to overseas markets, for example. So we have some of those, and they are the classic inventor types. They love Jesus. They have a long list of companies and products uh, that they've, they've developed. They're solid people and would, would benefit from a capital partner. Yeah. I mean, South Africa is, in some respects, it's a little, 
there's, there's a fair amount of inventiveness. A missing element is capital. What makes Silicon Valley work is you've got the universities plus the access to the capital plus a pool mm -hmm. of smart people to work on things. Nowadays, people are discovering not all of the smart people in the world are in Silicon Valley. You know, they happen to be spread all over the place and they can do stuff often at a fraction of a cost in terms of, so there's a lot of FinTech incubators in Cape Town and other incubators that are set up where people are basically outsourcing some of the development. So, um, so there are good things that that uh, that come out of that almost as an incubator kind of environment, but but I think the sh the thinking has not always taken those overseas. So Andre has taken a South African company overseas, for example, he and his team, and that's great. As have other people in our REAP community, some of the guys at Librio, for example, started in Cape Town, gone across to the UK, branching out to other parts of the world. Some people will do that. Others need a prod and support to do that. And so I think we would see that same situation in, in India. So we have guys like Bernard, for example, from Ebo, where he has won uh, United Nations awards for his software we're in the healthcare space. It's completely scalable. It applies standard operating procedures to hospitals could apply anywhere in the world. And it needs capital to, to grow both within India and elsewhere. And mm -hmm. not a whole lot. We're talking about $5,000 per hospital, for example, <laughs> you know, and it's proven it, it works. It's got the awards, you know, uh, and the impact, the social impact is huge. If you look at the number of people who've died from COVID in India, it's completely dwarfed by the number of people that have died in hospitals through preventable, I don't want to call it malpractice, but just lack of following standard operating procedures. And he has an answer to that. I mean, it's 10 times the number of people that have died every year because something doesn't go quite right in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big, it's a big giant. And um, we, call those, yeah. we call those medical errors. <laughs> yeah. But you don't hear about it. And you know, the patient's not yeah. there to complain about it and so on. But these are big numbers. I mean, certainly is a big yeah. number. So when we look at these, there are people who've done great things in Indonesia, other parts of the world, and uh and they are with the right encouragement. And these are good, solid people. It's not like we want to do an app so you can get your dry cleaning quicker, you know, or you know, skip the line at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so those would be our initial ones. And, uh, and that often, so often these things come out of the visioning processes where, and more and more, fortunately, South Africans are going into the rest of Africa. That's great. Now, Africa has 90 million SMEs, as I've said before. 45 million of them are sitting in Nigeria. You know, we just, and if each one of those created two jobs, it's a, it's a big deal, right? And part of what we need, I believe, in both Lagos and in Egypt is, and I can tell you why, is we need something like an I-4 center, a business incubator accelerator, which we can do in conjunction with others to get these people up and going uh, better and quicker. I was approached by a company recently in the US that said, Brett, you got a lot of context all over the world. Uh, we want to do something in Central America, a country over there. We want to take our product in why don't you take it in and uh, we'll give you a percentage of the revenue? <laughs> it's just like, you know, I don't, I, it's one of the countries I don't have many contacts anyway. So I said to them, look, get your executive team together and I'll talk to you in a week. Uh, I have a different proposal for you. So a week later, we got together with their president, CEO, their COO has been through the week, uh, one of our executive intensives and so on. And so I said, look, you want to go into country X to sell one product, but God wants to transform country X. So you can either think about that up front or you can get dragged into it at the back end. So if you think about going into a Rwanda, if you pre-ask 
what are the likely businesses we will need? What are their likely needs? You can just research on the internet what their problems are. You can ask around and you know before you go to Madagascar or Zimbabwe or Namibia, you pre-know what the problems are. And then you ask yourself in the repurposing business community and if not there beyond, which companies could have viable solutions in that country? Yeah. Which ones are there and which are the additional ones? So you go in not just with uh, capital, but you go in with a process for transforming society, some businesses in a box, in your hip pocket, businesses that could actually solve problems. And for example, I've been talking to a gentleman who set up uh, businesses in the agricultural space to solve food security issues. And he's got the mechanisms, he's got the metrics and so forth, the actual businesses that can solve that. So if you pre-know what those businesses are that can go in with you and you understand the potential investment opportunities, then you can go in and you can track, tackle a country or a city holistically uh, not, rather than just going in and doing evangelism or doing societal change stuff or just mm -hmm. repurposing a handful of businesses, you know, uh, if you're not dealing with the broader issues. So that's it. That's the yeah. So then do you have uh, plans for uh, transforming society ventures that can set this up? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So we're looking at locations for 2022 and that would be, you know, these things tied together. Transforming society ventures, which surface businesses, which need to be re repurposed, those needing investments, those needing to fill the gaps where there are gaps. So these things, the repurposing business, transforming society and global giants, these things work in, would work in conjunction with each other, which would part of, be part of what makes it different from just a fund to, you know, to help Burundi or to help Malawi or wherever. Yeah, I just uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Brett, is um, will you allow the investors to invest into specific SPVs or are you looking to raise the first $10 million as a general fund? Uh, both. So they could, if there was very specific things, so for example, if on the list... Mm -hmm. Uh, on the list of things, somebody said, look, I'm really interested in that particular item and there's an SPV for that. Um, then, and somebody says, you know, that's what I'm excited about. That's what I want to do because of my industry background, my passion, whatever it might be. Um, and then others might be saying, okay, great. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, I want to see uh, Mauritius or Madagascar, whatever, transformed. And, I, and I'm happy to wait more like a search fund thing where you can surface the things and then come back to me and I'll still agree the terms and conditions. So the answer would be both. Okay. Yeah, I put my Mauritius picture on for you. I was there <laughs> last week. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was great. I got out just before they closed the borders, unfortunately. So... Because like in Mauritius, mm -hmm. the, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of good projects in Mauritius, especially around food and food security. Yeah. And there are a lot of transforming society projects in Mauritius yeah. that uh, one could get involved in as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is on my list. Yeah. That is on my list, so that's good. Right, I was I was going to say um, we'd love to invite a team to Lesotho. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll wrap up with the story. But uh, you know, Pete, some years ago, I was having dinner with my mom and my brother, and my mother, in her typical fashion, she said. I want to talk to you boys about something, <laughs> which is normally meant we're in trouble. But in this case, she had just come back from Lesotho and visiting her sister. Uh, and she said, I want to know why the missionaries went in there 80 years ago, 90 years ago, whatever. They built hospitals, they built schools and things. But now those same buildings are uh, falling apart, going to wreck and ruin. Why? What is it that we did wrong? Why is it that uh, there isn't sustainability there, etc.? And she wanted you know, to know 
what we thought about that and have a discussion about that. And uh, this raises the need for why there has to be a plan for societal transformation, not just dealing with either a healthcare issue or an evangelism issue or an education or a church planting issue, but a holistic, a holistic framework. And the world is thinking about these things nowadays. And so Lesotho, of course, is a, um, a country you can get your arms around um, and would be a great example um, for for this kind of project, but but the need to tackle, to not just bring in capital or to bring in the gospel or to bring in healthcare or whatever, if we don't look at the whole picture, it sounds like you're boiling the ocean. I understand that. It sounds grandiose, but it is part of our mandate. And, uh, and I think without the capital in all of its forms, we won't get the job done, whether it's in a Lesotho or in Namibia or or, you know, the UK? Um, yes, I totally agree with what you are doing. Um, just the, the question of the what, what the Moravians did, the, the model that they use, mm. and we can uh, extend on that model. Um, and that's exactly what you're doing. Going in, not like um, it's what Pete or um, Andre mentioning, the Lesotho thing, um, yes, there's a lot of that type of examples. But if you go in and get the community involved, like the school in, in Bonnyvale, that's one of the best examples. They've got a whole community involved. And the community, whether they could bring some bricks or cement or whatever, there their school stands proudly. And nobody will try to burn down that school because the community got involved. And that's how we're going to get transformation done. Um, it's a luminary. Just love that word in perpetuity. Love that. And I think we, I think we just, um, I think what happens is we, we tend to be very short-sighted. We need to fix the global giants today. But Scripture teaches who was, who is, and is to come. It's multi-generational. The kingdom has come. It is today still, and is still coming. And so the, the giants are the same thing. They were in the past. They're still here in the present, and they're going to still be in the future. And so we got to train and disciple, uh, not just our, today for ourselves, our households, but those who will come uh, ahead of us as well. So, you know, that, that's just a, a thing as well. So do we have a long-term vision uh, and not just a, a, an organizer of let's just do the giants today and try and kill them all today? The reality is you have to think about m multiple generations. And we say in the REAP training, if, you're, if, you're, if your vision can get done in one generation, it's probably not from God. Um, we, we have to think... We have to think long term, and part of the purpose of global giants would be, as this thing grows, that there would be governors, there would be trustees, there would be directors, there would be mentors who can continue this thing long after we've gone. And these are people whose businesses we funded, whose whose communities have been transformed, who've been involved, who've grown up, have seen how the good, the bad, and the ugly, the mistakes we've made, the things we've tried to do. Uh, but there's an economic engine behind it. When Zinzendorf died, back to the Moravians, they suffered from a loss of their economic engine because Zinzendorf was happy to take risks economically. And the elders that followed him weren't. Um, and, I mean, he grew up around money. He grew up as you know a wealthy guy and so forth and for him to go in and to buy a piece of land and to do this and to mortgage that and do that I mean, he had a high risk tolerance if you like and not everybody that followed him had the same risk tolerance and in the moravian communities where they kept the economic engine they remained sustainable and so sustainability is there has to be some uh, perpetual cycle thing that that keeps a fund going because the businesses we invest in might come and go but the ongoing movement 
needs an economic engine that's based on the belief in part that one of the best ways to transform society is to provide jobs, provide meaningful work, start businesses that solve problems, etc., not start a charity. Nowhere in this is there, and we're going to start a charity. I mean, it might be that when we've got enough money and we're in a particular situation and there's a pandemic or this or that, we have to throw a million dollars at something to solve a problem. But that's not the primary thrust of what we're talking about. Yeah. And so I would love to see a modern day Moravian type of situation with a sustainable economic component. What are the new businesses? In the old days, it was quite easy with Moravians. You know, you had, a, you had farms, you had mills, blacksmiths, bakeries, schools, etc. So what's the equivalent today in today's world? And that will actually um, transform, transform communities and bring them back to God's intent. No, fantastic. It was good to, good to um, hear the pitch again. And I think it's, yeah, it's, for me, it just boils it back down to just, um, you know, the, the commission just to disciple people. And if we can do that while transforming society, what an amazing opportunity.